Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. We're just gonna talk about faith for a little while. Anybody want to learn how to operate in faith? Here's, here's, my, here's my title. Seven steps to answered prayer. Seven steps to answered prayer. Seven steps to answered prayer. How do we say it? The name of the game in prayer is what? Answers. It's answers. Glory to God. We pray we ask, we believe, we hold on, we expect to receive from God. Let me read this verse to you, Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to Him must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Very powerful stuff. Without faith it is impossible. The word uh, C-H-O-R-I-S, uh, chorus there, without it means outside of faith. It doesn't even mean uh, not having any faith. It means operating outside of faith or differently than faith when you're approaching God. Uh, without faith, outside of faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who, uh, the word please is a very, very interesting uh, Greek word, and it just literally means not only to um, uh, have a, a, a positive report to please, but it means to be fully agreeable. It says, for outside of faith, it's going to be impossible to fully agree with God. Give me two big amens right here now. Because your mind will disagree with what you cannot see or what you can see that's actually different than what God said. For instance, if sickness tries to get on you, you can either go around saying you're sick or you can say, now what Jesus did for me, one time at Calvary with His stripes, I was healed. He bore my sickness, carried my pain. Uh, and, and so instead of being sick, I now stand on the Word of God that God has applied that, made it available for me. So I'm decreeing in Jesus' name, with His stripes, I was healed. But outside of faith, you're going to have a very difficult time agreeing with the fact that you may be running a fever and you call yourself healed. How many of you are glad that we are not the sick trying to get well? No, we are the healed who fight off sickness. We are the blessed who fight off the curse. We are the prosperous who fight off the poverty. Uh, we are those of faith who fight through doubt and unbelief. Right. Everybody doing okay? Yes. And without faith, it would be impossible, the Bible says, to agree fully with God. That's why the enemy will work overtime to try to keep churches, pastors, teachers, ministers, people, Christians, from knowing the Word of God, believing the Word of God, praying the Word of God, thinking the Word of God, and thinking according to the Word of God. Uh, because with, that's where faith comes from. So if you and I are going to agree with God and have Him working in our life, uh, one of the things we're going to have to do is learn the Word of God. And then begin to apply the Word of God. This morning I made, if you were in the morning service, if not you can watch it later. Uh, you can pull it up on the, on the website and watch it. But one of the things that's very important, there was a man named Balaam. And Balaam was a prophet. And Balaam knew about God, but he didn't know God. And so he was always conning around trying to do crazy stuff, and, uh, apparently. But he had a real issue because it wound up getting him killed, ultimately, but, uh, in, in a rebellion. But it's, it's a very interesting thing because his name means not connected or not of us. That's why uh, it's interesting how Paul said they went out from us, or John said they went out from us, and because they were not of us. For if they had been of, of us, they would have not gone out from us. How many of you have read that in the Bible? Yes. 
Well, when God calls you in a New Testament church, uh, we are not people that just, I, I'm, I'm using a term right now, I call it date around. We're not dating around all the other churches and ministries in the neighborhood. We love everybody. We bless everybody. We want to be as friendly and as upright and as positive toward every, and supportive as we can. But we come to the house of God where God has called us. And then we grow and we learn. Can I have a big hallelujah? Hallelujah. And when we go out in those areas, it's because we have laid hands on people and they are sent out in Jesus' name. It's interesting, in the last 30 days, I've had five churches ask us if they can uh, connect to us. That's a powerful thing. Five churches have said, can, can I affiliate with Abundant Life Christian Center? Well, the answer is yes, because I, I know all five of the pastors. And so I said, sure, that, that's wonderful. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. I don't know where all that's going to go before this year is over with, but I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. Come on, look at somebody and say, it sounds like he's going to be traveling again. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, if God said, without faith it is impossible to please Him, then I don't believe by any stretch of the imagination that God is saying, you cannot please me, Period. He's saying, you're going to have to agree with me according to my own word. You're going to have to work, walk, and talk according to the word of God if it's going to have a divine repercussion for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the first things uh, that I ministered years ago as a young minister was a series called Cooperating with the Spirit Realm. For instance, Jesus said, what you bind on earth would be bound in heaven. How many of you are glad you have some authority in the Spirit? Amen. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. One translation says it like this, and I think it's pretty interesting. It says, what you permit on earth is permitted, but what you deny is denied. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, can, can, I, can I use the, the low-hanging fruit for this one once again? You know, poverty is denied in heaven. Therefore, you're supposed to deny it on earth. Oh, I'm preaching real good. Hallelujah. Ignorance, lack of knowledge, all of those things are denied in heaven. Because there the Bible says we know all things. So we are to deny that here and begin to learn and grow and develop ourselves in the word and the ways of the kingdom of God. So the scripture, when God says without faith it's impossible, he didn't say, I have kept you outside of faith, period. So you cannot please me. He said, no, this is the way to please or to agree with God. Now, listen, the greatest day in your life, if God says you're healed, you need to start agreeing with God. If God says you're blessed, you need to start agreeing with God. If God says you're a person of peace, love, and joy, you need to begin to agree with God about yourself. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, you've got to get that in your inner man. Keep that in you. Go to Mark chapter 5 with me. Mark chapter 5, one of the great scriptures in the Bible. We're just, we're just going to talk faith for a few minutes this evening. I mean, if you want me to, I can go for about 26 weeks in this. <laughs> faith does come a certain way. We'll look at that in a moment. One of the great stories in the Bible, I love this particular uh, actual miracle that Jesus did. This isn't a parable. This is an action of Jesus. Mark chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. You ever wonder what throng means? You ever been pressed in on every side? Bumping into him? Thronged all around him. Pressed him. Thronged him. Jesus was already a rock star in his generation. Uh, you know, poor, poor little Jesus. Uh, you know, mad and sad and hurt and humbled down and just barely. Uh, you know, like in the movies sort of a thing. That guy doesn't show up in the Bible. He's just simply not there anywhere. Uh, that, that's man's concept for some reason or another because of a, a religious mindset that's been set around. Jesus was electricity personified. Uh, you can be sure he was magnetic. 
And the scripture says there were people that all around who were thronging around him. And then a certain woman uh, with an issue of blood. Wow, there's a word. She had had that issue of blood for 12 years. There are certain numbers in the scripture that God uses over and over and over and over. And one of them is authority. And I'm telling you right now that if your blood is messed up, your blood has authority over a lot of stuff. But you with the Holy Ghost, because you now have been born again and the blood of Jesus is on you and surging through you in the spirit, you've got some authority today. You have some rulership you have some dominion that takes place uh, because of who he is. The scripture says she had an issue of blood. If I were reading this in something other than King James, it says she had a slow hemorrhage. She had a slow hemorrhage. A certain kind of sickness that didn't kill you immediately, but would kill you ultimately because it was incurable. It's been going on for 12 years. She has a physical problem and she continues to lose blood periodically. And now after 12 years, it has gotten critical. She has to be anemic. She has to be weak. All of those things that take place with a continual loss of blood, they didn't do blood transfusions in those days. So now she's at a critical point. The scripture says, a certain woman had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all she had, was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Obviously in those days, uh, uh, the whole concept of medicine, which probably had some good benefits to it, but there was a lot of trial and error that was taking place, and there was a lot of almost witchcraft that went along with medicine, as well as some good medical practices that were taking place. And so, because she has an incurable situation and one that under the law banned her from being out in public in a public, in a public place, the Bible says, if a woman had an issue of blood, she could not sit somewhere publicly. And if anyone sat there, uh, then they had to go through a cleansing routine themselves because they were concerned that there was a blood disease that could be passed on. So that's actually in the Bible. So this woman is socially hurt. She is physically hurt. She is financially, she has spent all that she has. Uh, spiritually, she cannot go into the temple or into any tabernacle uh, any longer and be in a public place. And she's almost, almost in the condition of a leper. And it is the priest in those days who declare a person with a blood, uh, an incurable blood disease. And so she is in that place uh, where probably one of the reasons that she fell down in fear and trembling was because the high priest that in all probability had uh, branded her as a woman with an issue of blood uh, was standing right there next to Jesus. And she could have been stoned. She could have been penalized very, very severely. Had suffered many things, verse uh, 26, of many physicians had spent all she had was nothing better, and just got worse. The Bible says Christ has redeemed us from the curse, the curse of the law. The curse of the law was poverty, sickness, separation from God. Are you listening to me? All of those things were, are named emphatically under the curse of the law. Well, here's a woman, and Jesus uses this great healing miracle to let us know that Christ hath redeemed us, Galatians 3.13 says, from the curse, being made a curse for us. He's about to break off of her by faith. Come on, shout faith. faith. He's about to break off of her poverty, nothing better, rather grew worse, spent all she had, sickness, spiritual separation, all of these things now that this woman is dealing with are things that are noted very plainly under the curse of the law. And the scripture says, uh, and she's getting worse. Verse 27, and when she had heard, she heard of Jesus. I'm not sure who went to her and told her about Jesus because you were really not supposed to be around this woman. So somebody loved her enough and cared enough about her 
She must have been a woman of means at one time because she spent her money for 12 years on physicians on an incurable situation. So she probably had money and probably had a particular lifestyle that would have been an attractive lifestyle. And then when she uh, begins to tear down and wear down and her money wears out, uh, you know how that story goes. And she's supposed to be in a quarantine or an isolated situation at almost all times. Yet someone talk to her about Jesus. I'm not talking about the fact that his mother says that she wasn't married to Joseph when, when, when she got pregnant. They talked about Jesus like this. I'm not sure what it is about him, but when he touches people, they get well. And there is, and one time he went through the town, I'm telling you, there was a funeral going on, and he bumped into the funeral tier, and when he did, the boy came back to life. There was a blind man, and I don't understand it, but he spit in the ground and made some dirt and mud and put a mud ball in his, in his eye. Of course, you made out of dirt to start with, and the guy washed his eye out, and the next thing you know, he had an eyeball there, and he was seeing. So I'm not really sure what they must have told her or what she heard, but one thing's for sure, she didn't hear that it was the will of God that she was sick. She didn't hear it was the will of God she was poor. And if she heard it, she wasn't listening to that because she heard about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, that's why uh, we are not to compromise or water down what we know about our Savior. Glory to God. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same. He does still heal. He does provide. He does restore. Uh, the Scripture says, when she heard of Jesus, she came in that throng, that press from behind and touched his garment. She touched, if, I, if we read it in Luke, uh, she touched the border, the, the tassel of his garment. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the priest were, had a border sewn around the bottom of their robe. Jesus was a priest, of course and had it uh, around the bottom of his, of his robe. It was a blue uh, a border that was around it. There was a blue thing that was woven all the way through it. There are many pictures. You can find all of those things, of course, online, or I can pop them up on the screen anytime you want them. But that's how they would dress. And the blue a border that was in there meant righteousness or uprightness before God. It meant that God was good, He was pure, He was clean, uh, He was all of those things. And so the priest would represent that. And the scripture says in Luke when he's telling this story that when she touched the border of His garment, the hem of His garment, oh hallelujah. I think that's pretty exciting because she was probably thinking something like, when I get up there, uh, I know that when I touch that hem of His garment, that instead of me being sick or him getting sick, when I touch him, he's not going to get sick, but I am going to get his righteousness. I'm going to get his answer from God. Whatever he has is going to transfer to me, and whatever I have is going to leave. She had to start believing that. That's why it's important to be a witness. That's why it's important to share with people when you have an opportunity because someone is watching you. Somebody knows about you. Someone's had a dream about God sending someone across their path or helping them or giving them an answer or ministering to them or the Lord has talked to them about something. And then here you are, you start witnessing and just talking about the goodness of God and it agrees with their spirit and the next thing you know, God breaks through for them and He did it through you. Instead of you getting their problem, they get your solution. The Bible says that she said uh, within herself, she had heard of Jesus. Everybody shout heard. heard. It's very important. She came in the press behind, touched his garment, for she said, if I touch but his clothes, I shall be totally restored. King James uses the word whole. And straightway, which means immediately. Instantly it begins. And straightway, the Bible says, the fountain of her blood was dried up. It stopped. She stopped bleeding. It stopped. And she felt in her body that she was now different. She touched the border of his garment. I believe she, she just got a hold of it and probably just gave a little tug on it. 
And then here this crowd, and, and uh, we understand from the other uh, gospel that she must have crawled from behind to touch him. And the scripture says, she said in herself, look at verse 28, for she said, everybody shout, say. say. Come on, say, say it. Say. Do it again, say it. Say, say it one more time. Say. Very important. She heard it, and now she is saying it. And the scripture says, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. It won't just be everybody else getting an answer from whoever this Jesus is. If I touch his clothes, I'm going to get well too. Oh, hallelujah. It's important to get this. Come on, do it one more time. Say, she heard. She, heard. she, said. she said. She did it. She did it. Say it again. She heard. She, heard. she said. She, said. She, did she did it. That's a powerful, powerful thing. We're talking about how faith operates. Uh, listen to it for a second. She said, if I touch his clothes, I'll be whole. Straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately, knowing in himself that virtue, the King James is the word virtue. Some of your scriptures will say this, but it's the Greek word here, dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. Deutimus is the word for power. Uh, for instance, Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And right here, Jesus knew in himself that power had gone out of him. Virtue, power had gone out of him. Now what's important about this is people are bumping into him all around. But someone touched him in faith and activated one of the qualities of the kingdom of heaven that can operate on the earth for you. The scripture says, and immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, he turned him about in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? Who touched my clothes? Right there they probably thought he'd had a sunstroke or something. That he was kind of losing it because he's being thronged all around. And now all of a sudden, Jesus stomps and says, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, you see the multitude thronging you, yet you ask us who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. I have a, uh, one translation, you know I've got about 40 translations of the Bible. And uh, this one particular translation, I love this one, says, he looked around and examined the faces to see which one had faith. Woo, I love that particular thing. Isn't that powerful? Now, I don't think faith is a certain look, like, you know, like that. But I believe there's, there's a knowing, obviously, Jesus knew that power had gone out of him, and that power is activated by faith. And he said, oh, I got to see which one of them had faith. Somebody just, people stepping on my foot, they're bumping all into me. Look, it's easy to try to want to gather around the Jesus show, because you never know when he's going to do some of his kingdom magic. He's going to heal somebody. He's going to do something. People run off and tell him about it. He's going to multiply something. And people go talk about it. But when somebody approached him on that level that was working in him to activate what was working in him according to his way, Hebrews 11 says, someone who is fully agreed with him as the answer and as God's solution, that's a whole different touch. When you, when, uh, when, when you tithe and offer, when we give, we don't throw money in a bucket, we believe in Jesus' name. Yes. Can I get a better amen? Yes. When we lay hands on sick people, I don't expect to get sick when I lay my hands on sick people. I expect sick people to get well. Yes. Not because of me, but because of the power that works through us. Yes. Uh, Jesus is the healer. He's the provider. He's all of those things for us. He's the Apostle Paul calls him. He's our all in all. Oh, glory to God. Come on, shout his name out loud three times, church. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Wow, there's something about that name. And the scripture says, this lady comes from behind, touched his clothes, and Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? Then he looked round about, verse 32, to see her that had done this. 
he begins to examine that throng, that crowd, to see which one of them had faith. He said, wait, something different happened. That's a different kind of a touch. There's a different touch. And the scripture says, the woman, verse 33, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, she wasn't about to get rid of, she wasn't going to let go of her healing. It didn't make any difference. She's about to get publicly exposed, not supposed to be in that crowd at all, against the law. Probably the guy that had, had quarantined her to start with and could have her punished uh, horribly was actually standing next to Jesus. His name was Jairus. He was one of the rulers. In all probability, he would have known about this woman. He would have for sure known about her because that kind of quarantine comes through the priests. They're the ones who would declare it. And the scripture says, so this woman fearing and trembling knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Told him all the truth. So it doesn't tell us everything that she told him, but whatever it was, it was true. I heard about you. I've been sick. Uh, gone through all my money. My health is deteriorating. Nothing better. Getting worse. Someone told me about you. I can't explain it, Jesus. But instead of just rolling over and playing dead and giving up and saying, well, I'm out of money and I'm out of health and I'm out of all of that and, and God must have done this to me and maybe it was the will of God. And instead of all of that kind of false teaching, she rose up and told him the truth. Something went off on the inside of me that said, if I can just, just touch you some way, if I can get close to you, whatever it is about you, Jesus, that releases this, this healing and all of these miracles, I believe that's going to happen for me. Amen. My experience is this, church. It's one thing to have an opinion. It's another thing to have a revelation. Right. Opinions are a dime a dozen. And they come and go, and they're very difficult to defend. But oh, when you get a revelation that comes from God, something on the inside of you, it's almost impossible for that to be stopped. You will do whatever it takes to obey God when you get a knowing, the spiritual knowing, that understanding, that revelation in your inner man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's talk about faith working. The Bible says, she then began to tell Jesus about it. She told him all the truth. Say this with me if you would please. She heard it. She heard it. She said it. She said it. She did it. She told Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Let's do it again. She heard it. She said it. She did it. She told Jesus. There's some principles of faith right there. If you're not writing this down, you ought to have all of this written down right now. Don't trust your memory to everything. Record it. Get it on the inside of you. Pencil it down. If you got a Bible that's so holy that you can't write in it, leave that one at the house up on the mantle and get one that you can write in and don't trust your memory to everything. Amen. And let the Spirit of God bring that notebook in and, and because you're going to want to see that and hear it. When the Lord begins to talk to you, there are things that, are, that will come up during this week. And when you're in the house of God, here's what will happen. The knowledge and the understanding of God is being imparted into you for something that's, that you're going to get a victory on this week. It's something that you're going to hear uh, tonight that's going to go off in your spirit. Then you're going to start saying it about yourself. And then you're going to do something this week. And then you're going to give God all the glory for it. And faith will just be working for you. It's the way it works. And the woman, fearing and trembling, came and told Jesus all about it. And he said unto her, Daughter, can I just segue just for a moment here? If for 12 years you've been cast out of society, physically getting worse, considered a leper, uh, almost as bad as a leper, no one can get around you. They got to bring food and leave it to you over there and you got to come get your own food. You can't go out and work in the general public. You're in an extremely difficult situation. And you probably used to be a, a, a woman of some means. Once again, she spent money for 12 years. Uh, she's a person uh, that would have uh, been known for sure in that, uh, in that region and in that area. Right here, we don't have her uh, name in this particular miracle. Uh, historians say, the Jewish historians say, her name was Veronica of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but let's for the sake of understanding. So here's Veronica. Here Veronica is, and she's been in this condition for 12 years. 
And she used to probably got, get invited to the birthday parties and she'd bring a real nice gift. She got to go to all the weddings. She was a person who was known in the temple. She was a, a woman of some means and there were very wealthy women in that day. Jesus just liberated them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Society, of course, would bind them up, but Jesus is the original liber uh, woman's liberator. I can tell you that now. He doesn't care if you're male, female, Jew, or Greek, the Bible says. Uh, uh, in, in Christ, glory to God, we're all the same as far as the ability of the Holy Ghost to use you. And so anyway, right here, uh, Jesus turns to her and she starts telling him all the truth. And Jesus, I, I don't know how long she talked. She might have talked for 15 minutes for all I know. And Jesus just looked at her and said, listen, daughter, daughter, can you imagine what that did to that woman? When the creator of heaven and earth doesn't call you an outcast, he didn't just call her woman. He didn't say, hey, you. He didn't even say Veronica. He got real personal. Can I have a hallelujah? hallelujah. He looked at her and he said, daughter, whoo, like you're a child of my kingdom. You're in my family. Daughter, daughter, thy faith. Thy faith, thy faith hath made thee whole. Your faith did this. He didn't say, my touch. He said, your faith did this. Now we know what her faith did. Her faith activated his power. And it went out of him. The Bible says virtue flowed out of him, bam, and touched her and healed her. Everybody around him should have got some kind of healing, but they weren't operating in faith. They were operating in sensation. They're operating in curiosity. Maybe they were uh, operating to try to disprove who he is. Maybe they were operating in, 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 in almost a suspicion of why is Jairus the priest uh, following Jesus? This is a setup. Is Jairus being converted or is Jesus being set up by the priest? Who knows why all of those people were around him. But all of those things would have been a part of it. But one person got close enough to activate his power. And the Bible says, he said to her, your faith. Now there's two kinds of faith. John Wesley said it like this. The greatest, the greatest problem with faith operating, look me in the face right here. This is John Wesley, the great, uh, the great preacher that, that today the, the Methodist church was built off of his positions, his doctrinal positions. He, and he was a Holy Ghost guy. You know, they fall out in the spirit and do all of that in the old shouting Methodist church the way it was back in those days. Today, Wesley would roll over if he, if he knew what was going on in some of them. But anyway, that's, that's another, for another story. Wesley said the biggest problem with faith today is mental assent. He said too many people try to mentally agree with the Word of God instead of believing in their heart. Yeah. Those are different things. Mental assent is something that you uh, adhere to based upon possibility and natural things. Where faith is something that God drops in your spirit. In, in mental assent, you hear it or see it with your eye, therefore you see it and agree to it. But faith is something that comes when the Word of God goes on the inside of you and lights up not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those are powerful truths. God, give us an understanding, I pray. Romans uh, 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How does faith come? I Say it out loud. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you read it once again, in, in its uh, uh, conjugation, it says it like this. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and continually hearing the Word of God. And all of a sudden it goes from just the inner ear to the inner man. And when it gets on the inner man, it gets inside of you. The Bible says that you are stronger in your inner man than you will ever be in the outer man. 
In Ephesians 4, Paul, uh, 3, Paul writes about it. It's very powerful. Being strengthened by the spirit of might in the inner man. Oh, glory to God. So then faith, the God kind of faith, not just the mental ascent. See, I have mental ascent. I have a natural faith. Uh, very simply, uh, uh, yesterday, here we are in the dead of winter. Oh, my goodness. Here, here we are in the dead of winter, and it got up to 65 degrees. Oh, man, we were suffering inside of our house, you know, because it's really air-conditioned. So it was probably 70-something inside the house. And so Cindy and I are putting away all the Christmas stuff. I know all of you guys did that probably on the 26th. But we're putting away Christmas stuff and doing all of those things. Had to call for reinforcements last night. <laughs> and we're putting all of that. And the next thing I know, I am sweating. I'm a, it's in the middle of winter. It's brutal this year. And here we are uh, sweating. So I go over to the thermostat. And I change it from heat to cool. And I put that thing on about... 70, 69, 70, and I walked off and kept on working because I knew I had faith, I had mental ascent that that air conditioner was going to come on because of experience and because of all of those things. And before long, glory to God, it felt like winter in there again. Sometimes you have to make your own winter. And so it cooled off inside the house. That's a mental ascent faith. Everyone has that kind of faith. You get in your car, and you're going to uh, start the engine, and you're going to turn on the headlights, and you know that you're going to be able to drive and get home. Therefore, that's why you do that. You have a confidence. You have a mental ascent, an agreement to yourself. That's the natural kind of faith. It's built upon some type of condition, situation, or circumstance. Normally a favorable, but it could be an unfavorable thing because you know what you know because of experience. Faith that comes from hearing the Word of God gets planted on the inside. And the kingdom of God operates by God's faith in our actions combined together. When we hear and believe, then we begin to Cast down imaginations that are contrary to the Word of God. For instance, uh, anytime sickness tries to get on me, and any person is subject to that battle, I don't go around saying I'm sick. I say, thank God with His stripes I was healed. I'm not denying the fact that sickness is on, uh, tries to come against you. I'm denying it's right to do that. Therefore, it has to leave, for Jesus defeated it. And it's in part of the, the redemption, the whole plan of redemption. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are a lot of people that don't even understand that it's in the plan of redemption. I'm telling you, there's people today that'll fight you. They'll nearly fist fight you to stay sick. You tell them, well, I believe Jesus is a healer. Thank God for our medicine. Thank God for all of the, the medical things that we have today. It's wonderful to live in the 21st century. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But oftentimes medicine is mercy. I believe it's the mercy of God until you see that miracle or that healing touch that comes from the Lord. So you stand in faith and you operate. Uh, the main thing is take care of your body. And whatever you do, don't own the sickness. You ever hear people own it? Well, this, you know, my pneumonia, my arthritis. Well, you know, this it runs in our family, so it's going to happen to me. You know, when I turn 40, it happens to me. It happens to all the women in our family. It happens when they get about 40 years old. Stop saying that. Amen. Would you stop saying that? Uh, how about beginning to declare, well, it might have run in our family like that, but I say it stops right here in Jesus' name. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and if that tries to get on me, I'm just going to uh, tell it it's got to go. According to Isaiah 53, 5, 1 Peter 2, 24, Mark 16, 18, I just refuse to let that get a hold in my life. I decree it's going to leave in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's how you should handle those type of things, by not denying that something is there, deny it's right to get a hold on you. Yes. Yes. You hear the Word of God. You begin to say the Word of God. You begin to act on the Word of God. Glory to God. And then you begin to give God all of the glory. 
and you magnify the Lord. That's how faith operates. Always has, always will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said to her, woman, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Those are two different words, and my time's about up for tonight. I actually got seven points I want to give them to you, but uh, sometimes, uh, praise the Lord. It doesn't always get in there, all, everything that we want to do at the same time. Uh, let's get our musicians back up here. Jesus uh, said unto her, woman, your faith made you whole. If you read it in, the, uh, in, in something other than King James, in some of your translations that you have, some of the other versions of King James you'll have right now, you'll see it. Uh, it says, your faith has healed your body. Go and be completely restored from this plague. Now, you've got to get that in your spirit. He said, your faith made you whole. And the same faith that made you whole will get you back 12 years of what you lost. Get your strength back to you. Get your health back to you. Uh, will resurrect that family that it looks like you've lost and everything else. Don't let the devil tell you that you're damaged goods. No, faith will make you whole from any plague. Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? Faith will make you whole. Well, I, I filed bankruptcy one time. I'll never be able to do bit. Forget that. Thank God you're a new creation in Christ. God supplies all of your need, and you can still do all things through Christ who strengthens you, whether you filed bankruptcy or not. Make adjustments that are necessary and continue to do what God has equipped you and called you to do. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. Get a hold of this. Let faith make you whole. Don't just get healed from your plague. Get well from the effects of the plague. That's what Jesus said faith would do. Now that faith has made you well of that situation you may be dealing with, and it doesn't have to be a physical illness, of course, but anytime we live in this world, and that's how the just live by faith. For the just shall live by faith. Write this down. Here it comes. Put it on the screen. Seven things. Here they are real quick. And number one, decide what you want from God. Decide what you want. This woman decided, I touch him, I'm going to be whole. And Jesus said, if you'll just keep a hold of that faith, you'll get totally restored from everything that you lost also. Woo, what a, what a promise from God. Decide what you want from God. James 1, uh, 6, 7, and 8 says, do not be double-minded. Uh, there, there's a great opportunity to be double-minded. Think of this woman for a moment. She's weak. She's not supposed to be out in public. Uh, she had no idea exactly how she was going to get to Jesus. She, and, and God records this for us to, to understand that there was a crowd thronging all around him. Right there, double-mindedness had its opportunity. She could have easily started doubting what she said she was going to do. Because in the natural, it, it was illegal. It was impractical. It didn't look like it was even possible. But she refused to doubt or be double-minded. She said, I'm going to touch Jesus. Now, I'm not even sure that she couldn't have done like Zacchaeus done and just stood over by a tree somewhere and she could have said, when he, when he passes by, his shadow is going to heal me. Because Peter, you know, that happened with Peter also. I'm not really sure, but she set the limits herself. She said it herself. When I touch him, I'll be whole. Well, thank God for that touch. Thank God for that touch. Uh, uh, if she didn't think that she could have gotten to him some way or another, and she, she had to time it just right. I mean, just think of the logistics of this. Here Jesus is coming down the road. People are thronging and bumping all into him. This woman obviously is covered. She's incognito some way. And finally, she has to crawl through that crowd to get there. You talk about a person who was not going to be double-minded. It was almost impossible that God would not have healed her because he used this illustration of how his power gets released to let us know that there are some things we do to cooperate with the spirit realm. We believe in our heart, we say it with our mouth, we act on our faith, and we give God the glory at all times. 
Here's the first thing in prayer. Decide what you want. You say, well, God knows me. I'm his child. Uh, listen, God knows every one of us. And he knows what you have need of before you ask. The Bible says that. But he said, you must ask. But ask in faith, nothing doubting. Glory to God. When you're praying, believe God you receive. Believe you receive. Believe you receive. The first thing he says right here is decide what you want from God. Here's the second thing. Get the scriptures. I like what Pastor Josh talked about this morning about memorizing the solution. Mem memorize the victory. Memorize the answer. When I was a boy growing up, from the time I was just a little kid, starting when I was just three or four or five years old in that age, they, uh, in, in church we would memorize the scriptures in the children's ministry, in the nursery, in the children, in the youth ministries, just the same way we do it here. We would endeavor to help uh, the little children memorize scripture. Well, at the time it's logos, but there comes a day when God says, draw out now, and that logos turns into the wine of, the, of, of God's wisdom and his spiritual understanding. That's why it's important uh, to feed your children uh, some knowledge of the Word of God. When I was a little boy growing up, uh, every night our parents would say, all right, be sure to read your Bible before you go to sleep tonight. So we'd have a Bible, a little Bible, a little New Testament, or just whatever Bible it was. There were seven of us kids, and mom and daddy wanted us to read something in the, in the Bible. It was just one, one verse. Read something before you go to sleep at night. Hallelujah. Well, today you don't have to do it. You can put in earphones and do the same thing today. You can look at it online, or you can just read. I, I still enjoy reading. I still enjoy pen and paper and, and all of those things because somehow or another God wrote things, and because he wrote it, there must be a connection between the hand and the, the eye and the brain. And so especially in memory, it just seems to help. I'm preaching better than you're even meaning. But read, number two, read scriptures that promise your answer. My time's up here. Here it is. Uh, Joshua 1.8 says, if you'll stick with the Word of God, meditate on it, and do it, you will have good success. Somebody shout, good success. And then I just say, uh, you need to, anytime your adversary, the devil, tries to get you off of your faith, you then begin to declare, it is written. It is written. Here's what the Word says. How did Jesus... How did Jesus combat everything that, that the devil was trying to do? It's not that the devil was on equal standing with, with Jesus, but Jesus let us know what took place when he was in the wilderness so we would understand how that victory works. Jesus said, it's written. How many of you glad the Word knew the Word? He just said, it's written. Glory to God. And he began to speak the Word of God. The Word of God is the will of God. Proverbs says, I delight to do your word, O God, or to do your will, O God, your word I have hid in my heart. The word of God is the will of God. So we stand on those promises. Here's the third thing. Ask God for what you want. Ask God for what you want. Don't just assume God loves me, knows everything I need, and he's, gonna, he's just going to do it. Well, if that's the case, he'd have, made, he'd have had you born pretty. And rich. No, 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 exactly the opposite. Ask God. Cindy and I had the honor of, of, of raising three daughters growing up. And there's nothing in the world that could make a, a parent get more frustrated than a little child always asking you for something. And every child does it. But at the same time, there's nothing more satisfying as a parent. Can I have a hallelujah? to have a child that asks you and you're able to help them. It's just a great thing. It's a great comfort to you. It's that whole mystery of, of parenthood. So it's a beautiful thing. Well, glory to God. Can you imagine when you ask the Father, the Bible says it delights His heart to give you the things that you ask for. So we ask according to His Word, according to His covenant, His will. Here's the fourth thing. We believe we receive the answer when we pray, when we ask. We believe we receive. I'm just talking about seven things right here. We believe we receive when we ask. We believe we receive when we pray. That's why Mark 11:24 24 says, what things soever you desire when you pray, 
believe you receive them and you shall have them. Mark 11, 24, powerful. Believe you receive. When do you receive it? 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 When you pray, you receive it. And Jesus said, then you shall have it. From the time you ask and believe in faith till the time you see it with your eyes, there's a span of time in there called the trying of your faith. And it's during that time when your adversary will do anything he can do to get you off of your faith. Situations, conditions, circumstance can try to get you off of your faith. That's when you believe in your heart. When you have asked, you realize your father is a good father. He hears you, he loves you, and he will answer your prayer. Now you begin to do the actions of faith. Very important to do that. Uh, understanding it's the trying of your faith. You say, well, the devil hates me. He's really after me. Look, look me right in the face. The devil could care less about you. He's trying to stop your faith. He tries to attack faith on the inside of you. Because without faith, it's impossible to agree with God's plan for your life. And you get an agreement with God according to his word, and it's impossible for your adversary, the devil, to keep back God's answer from you in this world that we live in today. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. Anybody getting a hold of this? And so we believe we receive when we ask. Matthew 17, 20 says, just like a grain of mustard seed, it's planted and then it grows and becomes the largest seed in the whole field, the largest plant. Well, faith begins to grow. When you speak the word, the word the Bible says in Mark 4 is a seed. And when you speak it, you have planted it and believed uh, and refused to get off of your faith. Get it in your spirit. And watch it begin to germinate. Watch it begin to grow. Watch it conceive and begin to produce. Just like a birth takes place that way. Spiritually, it's that exact same way when you speak the Word of God. Some seed grows faster than other seeds. Some manifest fruit faster than others. But it doesn't make any difference. Jesus is the one who taught more than one time. And the example is many times in the Scripture where the Word is sown and then the Word has a process. Sometimes it happened almost instantly and sometimes it just happened what I'll call ultimately. But either way, if you stand on that Word and let it begin to grow and, and, and conceive and begin to germinate and, and produce and develop before long, you're going to have the thing you've been believing God for. You just have to maintain what you say. I, I want to give you a dozen examples, but time won't let me tonight. Because once you get that seed planted and you cultivate that with faith and with your words and your actions and praising God for it in advance, thanking God for it until you see it with your eyes because you've already got it in here. That's why Hebrews 11 1 says, faith is the substance of things expected from God and the evidence. That faith is your evidence that you have it. Therefore, you shall have it. One translation says, it's your title deed. Oh, glory to God. Faith is a title deed. It's yours. I don't care who's trying to claim it. If you have the deed, it's yours. If that deed is yours, it's yours. Faith is the title deed. And the Word of God is what declares it. And then the fifth thing, very important, refuse to doubt. Just refused to doubt. This woman with the issue of blood had every opportunity in the world to doubt if she wanted to take them, but she just decided not to accept any of those opportunities. She said, no, I'm just not going to doubt. I don't care how many people are throng and how weak I am, how much money I don't have, nor anything else, how legal or illegal uh, under the law it is. I don't care if Jairus is the one standing by there. I don't care if I have to crawl up there. When I touch those garments, I know something has gone off in me called faith, and I know when I touch him, somehow I'm going to get whole. She didn't know that she was going to release the same power that said, let there be light. And that power went out of him and that uh, of Jesus and, and earth was created. She had no idea that she was going to be operating with the creator of heaven and earth. But faith activated him and stopped the creator of heaven and earth in its tracks. Stopped him right there. Turned around and said, whoo, who did that? 
Man, that's a fake touch. I've been going all over Israel looking for faith. Which one of them did that? She said, this is how I did it. I heard about you. I believed. I acted on it. I, I'm telling you everything now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know in my body I'm here. Jesus, woman, your faith didn't just get you well. Your faith just got back 12 years of what you lost. Oh, hallelujah. Refuse to doubt. Doubt is not from God. James 4, 7 says it very plain. It says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee. Get that doubt out of you. James 1, 8. God wants you to be stable in your mind. Be fixed in your mind. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, 4, and 5 says, to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the Word of God and bring those thoughts into captive. Capture those thoughts. Maybe you have historically thought a negative thing when a negative thing would happen. You can't get two negatives and expect a positive. Can I have a big hallelujah there? No, think the Word of God. Capture it. Number six, here it is. Meditate on the promises of God. Probably the, the least used or taught on truth in the Scripture is the power of meditating the Word of God. One, one uh, author says it like this, and actually one of the definitions actually in the Greek says it like this, to to mutter or to lightly speak the Word of God under your breath, to meditate. There's nothing in the world more powerful than meditation. I am very much a proponent of godly meditation. There's never a message that I preach that I don't put at least one hour of meditation into it, where I've, I've asked God to help me, where I uh, think myself real clear on something, Understanding what the Lord would have me to, to say and talk about or when I believe he would at that moment. Then I believe God to pray and build myself up and I like to call it pray myself hot. And then the third thing is just turn yourself loose. Hallelujah. Listen, when you come to the house of God, come on, think yourself clear. Praise yourself hot and turn yourself loose in Jesus' name when you walk out of this place. And just be everything God's called you to be. Uh, uh, accept every opportunity to, to uh, witness and to share the gospel. Meditate on the promises of God. Proverbs 4, 20, 21, 22 says meditate on the Word of God. Keep that Word of God in front of you. Know the Word of God. Stick with the Word of God. Don't get off of the Word of God. It is health to your body and health to your soul. John 15, 7 says, If you'll abide in that Word and let that Word abide in you, you can ask what you want and it'll be done unto you. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. The Word, of course, uh, is the rhema, receiving that revelation that God gives you with His Word. When you meditate on the Word of God, you help yourself, you train yourself to speak in line with the Word of God. If you have a negative tongue or a tongue that's always uh, controlled by circumstance or condition, if there's not enough money or you don't feel good or whatever the case is, look, uh, meditate on the, on the promises of God so when you do speak to someone or speak to yourself, you will have prepared yourself in advance because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And when you speak the Word of God, guess who the first one is that hears it? It's you. You're hearing it. And you'll stay so strong that hell can't overcome you in any situation, especially if you think about it in advance or you'll meditate the promises and the covenants of God. Here's the last thing, number seven right here. Give God all the praise. Give God the praise. Oh, hallelujah. Philippians 4, 8 says, give God the praise. Think on the things of God and give Him the praise. Think on the things of God and give Him thanksgiving and praise at all times. Did you learn something tonight? Come on, let's give God all of the glory right now, church. Clap your hands to the Lord. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.